Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm joined today by Eric Fussfield, our Director of Legislative Affairs and the Deputy Director of the B'nai B'rith International Center for Human Rights and Public Policy. As anti-Semitism rears its ugly head again and again throughout the country and around the world, we have watched in horror as Jews have been assaulted and killed in Muncie, New York City, Pittsburgh, Poway, and elsewhere. With this surge in anti-Semitic attack showing no signs of ceasing, what can be done at the federal and state levels to combat this trend? What can be done overseas about these trends? And how can Jewish organizations address growing anti-Semitism effectively? Those are the questions today and more. Eric, thank you for being with us today on the podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you. So since the last time we spoke, uh, so much uh, has happened uh, on the street and and elsewhere regarding anti-Semitism. What are the current sources uh, of anti-Semitism, and what are recent trends in this area, just to bring us current? Let me cite some recent developments. We have noticed, let's say over the last couple of years, an increase in physical violence against Jewish targets, an increase in Internet activity, spreading anti-Semitic messages. Uh, We've noticed a growth on the left and among youth and minorities, um, a a particularly uh, swift increase in anti-Semitism. And this is added to the normalization and mainstreaming of anti-Semitic attitudes. And we've also noticed a lack of moral outrage, I would say. There's been a tendency when physical attacks occur against Jewish targets to couch these incidents in the context of social friction between groups or or otherwise downs downplay anti-Semitic displays. Well, so one word about that, about uh, the, the lack of outrage, kind of a... Uh an apathy or an indifference, perhaps, that would be a better word. Uh, My sense is that it took the machete attack uh, at the synagogue in Muncie, um, which resulted in uh, the serious wounding of five people, uh, to put this issue, the issue of anti-Semitism, on the front page. And I say in front page, literally, in the New York Times and the Washington Post, among among others. why do you think that it that it was at this confined to the inner pages, if at all, uh, over the past uh, number of years as the number of incidents uh, of anti-Semitism increased? Well, it's been a slow drip drip, unfortunately, of violent attacks against Jewish institutions and individuals. We had... Um, the attack in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, and then it was Poe in California, and other subsequent attacks. And it, it was uh, at first met with uh, a certain level of surprise, as though these were the kinds of incidents we associate with Europe and other parts of the world. But we felt the level of comfort here in the United States that uh, allowed us to feel like, well, it's not really our problem. Fortunately, we're safe and secure here. We don't feel that way so much anymore. And uh, I think there's also a tendency, and this is part of the challenge that we face in confronting the issue, to think of anti-Semitism as a, a Jewish issue, like it's somehow just the responsibility of our community to deal with this problem. And in fact, it's, it's really something very different than that. Anti-Semitism is everyone's problem. And it, it, it falls on all of us, all of society falls on our leaders to, in, in major institutions in our society to confront the problem, speak out against it at every available opportunity. Now, getting to the root of the, the current epidemic, um, you know, I was uh, doing some research for uh, a piece that I wrote uh, about the 1930s, and I was recalling, uh, you know, my mother telling me um, when I was growing up uh, about the German-American Bund and the uh, Gerald L.K. Smith and Father Coughlin. Uh, Father Coughlin uh, did have uh, the megaphone of radio in his day, so he did reach a large audience. But there were many others in the pre-internet age 
uh, who had followings, but had they had the internet, had they had social media, um, their uh, message would have uh, reverberated far beyond. So um, how do we deal with the issue now where there's just untrammeled access through the internet uh, to, um, to the anti-Semites uh, to say and, and, and to uh, espouse the kind of hatred that they do? How do, we, how do we get our arms around that? This makes the challenge much greater for us in, in the internet age. Uh, online activity and uh, on on messaging apps and hate sites has allowed um, anti-Semitic uh, screeds to proliferate and reach a much greater audience than they would have a generation ago, and so uh, it it uh, it falls on us to, for one thing confront the major actors uh, of the internet, uh, the Facebooks and the Googles and so forth, uh, to identify hatred and challenge them not to provide a platform for it. We have a problem right now with with Facebook, whom B'nai B'rith has met with directly a number of times, uh, engages regularly about uh, the um, uh, about messages of hatred that occur on, in their, on their platform, uh, Facebook does not identify Holocaust denial as uh, a, a form of hate speech. And of course, Holocaust denial is one of the most conspicuous manifestations of contemporary anti-Semitism. So we have some work to do in, in making the case there. We need to challenge all the major actors in our society, major institutions, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google, whether it's uh, a major newspaper or a television station that um, provide platforms for haters, uh, we need to convince them that they shouldn't be giving a voice to people who only uh, disseminate anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry. We recently marked the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, uh, but the Holocaust continues to figure in contemporary anti-Semitism. And I have in front of me here a cartoon which appeared in the um, Portuguese publication Sabado, uh, drawn by the cartoonist Vasco Gargallo. And the, the cartoon uh, depicts, it, there's a brick wall and it says Arbeit macht frei. Uh, uh, on the on the top, which is the, the um, over the gates of Auschwitz, uh, and there's a crematorium here, and a coffin with a Palestinian flag is um, on top of the coffin, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is pushing the coffin into the crematorium with an armband. The armband normally would have, of course, the swastika, but in this case, it's the Star of David. Now this is. 75 years after the Holocaust, so much effort was put into uh, an international uh, awareness campaign, culminating in a, a very important gathering in Jerusalem of over 40 uh, heads of government, heads of state, and, and other uh, important uh, figures uh, to remember. And yet, this kind of anti-Semitism still makes its way in contemporary times, here in 2021, um, into, um, uh, into the newspapers and, uh, and on the internet. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, very relevant to this discussion is the fact that Pew Research recently, very recently released a survey that indicates that millennials know less about the Holocaust than previous generations. Uh, a, a, approximately half of the world's population to the extent that we're able to measure it, doesn't even know that the Holocaust ever took place. And this is something we've always feared, that as time passes and generations shift, the Holocaust recedes into the history books. Its lessons largely faded, if, if not altogether forgotten. And Holocaust survivors are uh, passing away, uh, uh, and uh, very few of them remain. 
So the problem uh, of uh, keeping the lessons of the Holocaust alive and relevant will only become more challenging to us over time. Uh, European countries have struggled with confronting their own World War II era past and accepting responsibility for the role that their societies played. We need to confront them about this. We need to demand that they confront their own history in an honest and open way. And uh, we've seen this as a problem in Bulgaria and Hungary and elsewhere where neo-Nazis organized marches to honor fascist leaders. That's unacceptable. In Poland uh, last year, the, the government passed or was on the way to passing um, remembrance legislation that would have made it more difficult for people to comment on Poland's role during the Holocaust. And, They've taken some steps back, but it, it's uh, believed that this has impeded um, a, a open uh, an inquiry and investigation into uh, Poland's world wartime past. Um, the debate over Holocaust restitution has resulted in an increase in anti-Semitism, sparking attitudes like, well, here come the Jews again looking for money. Um, as though that's what Holocaust restitution is about. It's not. It's about uh, acknowledgement uh, of what was done to Holocaust victims so that they and their descendants can uh, um, achieve some uh, measure of peace about it. Um, and uh, it, we see that in some places, Holocaust education focuses on the universal lessons of the Holocaust, but emits references to Jews and anti-Semitism. And it also lacks in national or local stories that would make it easier for students to engage in lessons that they see as more relevant to them in their country. So we have a lot more work to do in improving Holocaust education, for one thing. And there are programs for doing this. Um, the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, which uh, has uh, done a lot of work to combat anti-Semitism. B'nai B'rith has been very involved in this international body. And they have programs on uh, Holocaust, Holocaust education and, and education to combat intolerance. And these uh, efforts need to be supported. And uh, I would also add for those listeners in the United States, there is uh, legislation in the United States Congress, the um, Never Again Holocaust Education Act, which would enhance resources for Holocaust education across the country. And it's, it's recently passed in the House of Representatives and the Senate needs to pass it as well. So we need to urge our senators to do that. Let's go back to Europe for a second. Uh, B'nai B'rith's uh, Brussels office, our European Union office, uh, has engaged um, uh, quite intensively with the European Parliament uh, and friends in the Parliament, um, also in uh, trying to uh, to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little about that. Right. Through our uh, uh, collaboration or cooperation with members of the European Parliament who have taken the initiative on this, uh, we've help form a task force on combating anti-Semitism. And this is something that involves uh, elected officials from a wide range of parties, from a wide swath of countries across Europe. And they've taken a stand on um, measures that should be adopted to confront anti-Semitism, anti spoke out on um, incidents of anti-Semitism, and really set an example for their fellow politicians, for fellow leaders in Europe, for to um, identify the problem and speak out against it, it's it's um, it, it's just one step forward, but uh, it's a very encouraging one. Coming back uh, to the domestic uh, scene, you know, I've always said, and I think this is a it's, it's really kind of a truism um, that um, really, in order to uh, defeat this menace. Uh, you really need friends and uh, you need allies. Uh, and um, I know that uh, you are um, engaged uh, congressional offices um, on Capitol Hill uh, on this question. 
Um, we are in frequent contact uh, with Elon Carr, who is the U.S. Special Envoy on Anti-Semitism. And even though uh, his uh, mandate is to cover anti-Semitism outside the United States, um, in the absence of a, uh, a special coordinator or a national coordinator here, um, he also has kind of stepped in. One of the things that we're calling for is the appointment of a special coordinator in the Justice Department, for example, who could, on a daily basis, monitor and report. That's right. And th this is something that several countries in Europe have already done. Germany, Bulgaria, very recently, Italy have adopted national coordinators to um, centralize um, approaches to combating the problem. We feel that this is something that should be done here in the United States as well. Ilan Carr, who you mentioned, the State Department envoy, his mandate, he's done excellent work around the world uh, spotlighting the problem, but his mandate includes every country in the world except the United States because it's a foreign affairs position. So uh, situating this kind of position at the Justice Department and having that person work with uh, officials from the, across agencies, Justice Department, FBI, Homeland Security, uh, we feel could be a, a good way to marshal resources and um, coordinate uh, the, the strategies. A couple of months ago, there was um, an executive order um, to uh, fight anti-Semitism here in the United States, uh, many people focusing on the campus where this is uh, a, a major problem because of the BDS movement. Uh, we welcomed uh, that, that order uh, as a, uh, a very important tool and very important weapon in fighting anti-Semitism. Yeah, th this executive order, uh, it received some criticism that I think was ill-founded um, it, 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 uh, because I, I think there was some misunderstanding about what this order does. This order is uh, something that has been mirrored in congressional legislation that has not passed yet, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. And essentially what this would do is take the working definition of anti-Semitism adopted a few years ago by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and make it available as a tool uh, to um, educate um, uh, campus uh, administrators and, and educators and others charged with combating anti-Semitism on campus to raise awareness of what the problem is. I, I think that anti-Semitism, uh, as it often occurs in college campuses, is widely misunderstood because there's a tendency to say, well, this is a debate about the Middle East and uh, we don't want to get involved in political debates. But, but th this is something, in fact, that, that taking place in college campuses that goes far beyond uh, the limits of legitimate political debate. It, it's really anti-Semitism in a different guise. The BDS movement uh, takes on all kinds of, um, uh, of configurations. And um, just uh, recently, um, we here at B'nai B'rith uh, called on Major League Baseball uh, to disassociate itself from a campaign to promote uh, the upcoming uh, tour of uh, Roger Waters, uh, the front man for uh, the group Pink Floyd, um, because of his uh, outright uh, anti-Semitism uh, tied in somewhat to BDS and also beyond BDS. Um, how is that battle on the campus, uh, in, the, in the arenas where uh, uh, musicians uh, like Waters perform, um, how are we doing in terms of, of turning that tide back? Well, we have a lot of work to do on college campuses. You know, college campuses tend to be the breeding ground for intellectual movements and political causes. And I think anti-Semitism anti has gotten swept up into... Um, and a number of other causes which are not necessarily related, but they are seen as interconnected. This is the uh, academic theory of intersectionality. 
uh, which holds that if uh, that um, a lot of progressive causes um, should be interconnected. So in other words, if you are for a cleaner environment, if you're for raising the minimum wage, uh, other social concerns, then you need to adopt the pro-Palestinian cause and oppose Israel because this is somehow seen as a way of um, supporting uh, justice and, and peace. But it, it really involves a complete misunderstanding of the Middle East conflict and of Israel's um, security predicament. But um, And it also applies uh, more than double standards uh, to Israel, that, that Israel, that the, the existence of Israel is being called into question. You know, originally with BDS, you know, the, those who, who would apologize for it would say, well, this is all about uh, the territories and about the occupation. It is far beyond that. It, and the la- kind of language is, which is being used and the kind of in- intimidation against pro-Israel students on campus uh, has now you know, risen to a point where it's very clear what's going on. Well, there's no question if you read the statements of the founders of the BDS movement that their goal is the elimination of the Jewish state, which in and of itself is a, um, an inherently anti-Semitic aim. This is something that we know from the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism. It's denial of um, the right for a Jewish state to exist. Now, if you are a student on campus, perhaps even a Jewish student, who, uh, like I said, gets swept up in the movement, and you really um, don't want to eliminate a Jewish state, but you just want to support uh, justice and fairness, you might get co-opted by this movement. But I, I think we, we can't lose sight of what the the, the founders and the organizers of the movement have uh, as their goal. And the Roger Waters example that you mentioned, it, it's very illustrative because Roger Waters is somebody who, he's not just a critic of Israel. He talks about, he, he, he very often, this is classic anti-Semitic uh, behavior, he borrows on traditional anti-Semitic motifs to illustrate his anti-Israel message. So in other words, he um, says that there are like-minded people in the music industry who will, uh, who, who would also like to boycott Israel, but the Jewish lobby is pressuring them. Uh, this reference to Jewish power is kind of um, overwhelming. Is, uh, is a classic anti-Semitic trope. Uh, and, and his accusations against Israel, he's not taking issue with this policy or that policy. He's calling Israel an apartheid state. He's, call, he's saying Israel is guilty of ethnic cleansing. This, this again, the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism says, if you try to depict the Jewish state as a racist enterprise, as Roger, Roger Water does, then you are guilty of denial of the um, leg- the Jewish people's legitimate right to a homeland, and that's an anti-Semitic Semitic, uh, exercise. Well, you referenced uh, IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, uh, and at its uh, definition, working definition of anti-Semitism, and it's a it's a uh, the IRA definition is something that you've worked on for a long time. It seems now that that countries uh, and and others are picking up on this definition. Um, it, do you think it'll stop here, or do you think that that's a that's a good sign that will lead to even uh, more activity to fight anti-Semitism? Well, I, I I don't think it'll stop if we keep pushing it, and uh, it's very encouraging that 19 European countries so far have adopted. Uh, the working definition of anti-Semitism. The United States has also adopted it. So we need to keep encouraging more governments and more international bodies, and, and, and not just governments, but, but even um, institutions like uh, universities and uh, other actors, influential actors in our society should embrace this working definition because it... it um, 
it clarifies the problem. There's been so much ambiguity and confusion about what anti-Semitism actually is. This clarifies. And so it, it, um, it, it raises awareness of the problem and helps us focus our attempts to combat it. Well, on that note, I'm sure we'll be revisiting this uh, more than once. And so, Eric, I appreciate your joining me today uh, to have this discussion about uh, an issue which is more than vexing in our community, uh, but is uh, uh, very much on our minds, um, not only here in the United States, but also abroad as well. And thank you, everyone, for listening to our podcast today. Please visit our website, benabrith.org, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe on your smartphone through the podcast app for iPhone or through Google Play for Android. And lastly, tell a friend about us. For my guest, Eric Fussfield, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. We'll talk to you next time on the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. Thank you.